Jack Fletcher will introduce our next speaker. Again, I have the, the honor to introduce to you someone whose presentation uh, I think naturally follows the discussion on pressure drops since the first step is synthesis gas generation. And um, therefore I'd like to give a little word of introduction to Dr. Tony Samuels, um, whose paper, and this is very similar to the one I saw in the middle of last year, really intrigued me in the sense that it brings let's say some next generation technology, in this case the idea of using catalytic membranes to a very old and necessary area of catalysis, namely the synthesis of, uh, or the generation of synthesis gas. And I hope you will find this uh, really quite interesting, more importantly because it is not, it is beyond the academic level, he has demonstrated admittedly on a moderate scale, but at least lifetimes which make one suggest that this can be industrially viable in the not too far future. Tony's background um, is really in the area of electrochemistry, if I, if I read between the lines. He um, received his bachelor's degree from the University of London, his PhD from the uh, University of California in Santa Barbara. He then spent approximately a decade working for various people, including um, Institute for Gas Technology in Chicago, Rockwell International, and Gould, at which time, in about the early 1980s, he decided enough of working for other people, and he started his own business um, called Elton, out in Boulder, Colorado, where his activities relate to essentially electrochemistry, catalysis, and material science. And without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you Dr. Tony Samuels. The most difficult part of getting a presentation is trying to figure out how to switch this thing off. Here, that's what I'm here for. Got it. Figured it out eventually. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about uh, um, some of the technology that we're developing within our uh, company. Um, electrochemistry is often a much, uh, much, a much maligned subject uh, because uh, the um, the opportunity for um, effectively implementing this techno electrochemical technology is somewhat uh, is somewhat difficult. And so, uh, the uh, really what I'm talking about today is the, is really going to talk about the the. Uh, some development work and some technology that we have developed within our own company, which uh, <clears throat> which is really in the area of uh, uh, a technology called catalytic membrane reactor <clears throat> uh, technology, which has the um, ability to um, separate out um, oxygen spontaneously from the atmosphere. <clears throat> and the really the point I want to get across on this uh, presentation is the fact that uh, <clears throat> although the, um, we don't, do not have um, uh, uh, electrodes in the conventional sense uh, of, the, uh, of electrochemical technology. The basic principles which govern this, um, this ceramic, dense ceramic membrane technology, and the chemical processes which are occurring on each, um, <coughs> occurring on each surface of the, um, of the membrane are in fact electrochemical in nature. Although, uh, in the case of um, uh, converting methane or natural gas to uh, synthesis gas, or converting methane into ethylene, or converting uh, H2S to sulfur and water, or, or any of those kinds of processes, they are essentially, um, uh, they are in fact thermodynamically downhill spontaneous processes which do not require the, um, uh, the use of any um, electrical energy. <coughs> <clears throat> the um, just give you a little background as to um, the genesis again of this technology. This is the <clears throat> some of the kind of stuff um, my little company does. We currently employ about seventy people. Much of the <clears throat> stuff we do has to do with um, <clears throat> has to do as, as uh, Jack mentioned uh, electrochemistry, <clears throat> and for many years and even still currently. Uh, we have 
put a considerable amount of effort into the development of fuel cells, and uh, we are still very active in that area. And one of the um, opinions or strategies that we developed, uh, having worked in the area of um, molten carbonate fuel cells for many years, I changed my strategy uh, within uh, within Eltron to uh, uh, try to identify a um, a new generation of oxygen conducting solid electrolytes, uh, which would uh, at least allow us to operate fuel cells or solid oxide fuel cells at temperatures somewhat below uh, that uh, where the current uh, yttria stabilized zirconia fuel cell technology develop, uh, is operating. And uh, as many of you probably know, uh, yttria stabilized zirconia solid oxide fuel cells typically operate at around <clears throat> around a thousand degrees and our strategy uh, uh, over many years has been to develop <clears throat> solid electrolytes these are dense ceramic materials which are exclusive <clears throat> oxygen ion conductors uh, uh, our strategy has been to develop um, solid oxide fuel cells based on um, ionically conducting ceramics which have sufficient ionic connectivity to make them operate at practical rates in the 750 to 800 degrees centigrade range. And the reason for that temperature range <clears throat> is primarily because the cost of the um, ancillary hardware is significantly less. Um, issues such as solid state diffusion of catalysts into the <clears throat> into, into solid electrolyte um, uh, uh, um, uh, can limit the lifetime of the device. <clears throat> well, I'm not, so not going to give a talk about fuel cells, but uh, the only reason I mention that is in the course of developing these materials, <clears throat> the vast majority of new solid electrolytes or <clears throat> materials that we thought were very attractive in fact deteriorated with time. <clears throat> and the reason that they deteriorated with time for a considerable number of them was the fact that they um, uh, became, because of the reducing conditions, the chemically reducing conditions present on the anode, which is where hydrogen or methane becomes oxidized, <clears throat> or because of the very oxidizing conditions that are present on the cathode where uh, atmospheric oxygen becomes uh, reduced to uh, <clears throat> oxygen anions, the material is deteriorated by the, by the formation of uh, electronic connectivity <clears throat> uh, within the membranes themselves, <clears throat> within the solid electrolytes. And so what we had was, <clears throat> as it were, we were de unwittingly developing an inventory <clears throat> of um, uh, of dense ceramic materials, which were not only uh, oxygen ion conductors, but also they had some <clears throat> intrinsic uh, electronic conductivity, and many of them were in fact um, uh, thermodynamically uh, stable, <clears throat> but even so, they were of no little value to um, uh, 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 in a conventional electrochemical device. And that was really the genesis of the <clears throat> this area over here, which is really to do which is really technology we have de developed, which relies upon having um, uh, a dense ceramic material which is both ionic and electronically um, conducting. <clears throat> so that the, uh, for a thermodynamically downhill process, <clears throat> the, um, the mediation of oxygen, atmospheric oxygen, through the uh, membrane can occur with 100% uh, uh, selectivity because the method of mediating um, oxygen uh, through the membrane is essentially, as I have mentioned probably repeatedly, a, an electrochemical, um, <clears throat> electrochemical phenomenon. <clears throat> so what I'm going to talk about today <clears throat> is really what is a uh, catalytic membrane reactor. <clears throat> um, the real the incentives for developing um, a dense uh, um, uh, uh, ceramic materials which are effective for mediating uh, oxygen through them. <clears throat> um, uh, I'll talk somewhat about the, the, the strategy for evolution of, um, of these membranes, uh, primarily as far as the, the thought processes or the, the thinking processes which uh, we followed in order to um, uh, select <clears throat> in, some, <clears throat> in some sort of rational manner uh, the lattice substituents which would allow us to have uh, <clears throat> high stability uh, and uh, particularly rapid uh, oxygen mobility or diffusivity um, through the membrane. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> most importantly, of course, the whole issue <clears throat> of, um, of the longevity. Um, and that's always a, 
a key issue. Um, and uh, uh, for many of these materials, uh, it is quite uh, straightforward to talk about the performance of these materials, but the key issue is that these materials have to last for a considerable amount of time. <coughs> and uh, uh, I'm going to sh show you some sort of performance we've been getting with these materials and the kind of lifetimes that we have been uh, <coughs> uh, achieving with, um, uh, with these catalytic uh, membrane reactors. <coughs> well, again, what is a mixed conducting uh, catalytic, catalytic reactor? This is not a microporous membrane. This is a totally dense material. <coughs> Typically, um, they are relatively dark in color, but they have the same physical um, characteristics as alumina. They are non-porous, dense, <coughs> and they are exclusive. Uh, the only two species that they conduct are electrons and oxygen anions. So the oxygen ion conductivity <coughs> proceeds through the um, uh, through lattice sites within the uh, within the solid state lattice. <coughs> this is a very simplistic um, uh, simplistic figure. It doesn't actually represent the processes occurring, which I'll show you a little later. But <coughs> in principle, what uh, what our technology does, it basically separates out oxygen <coughs> from the atmosphere. Oxygen species <coughs> mediate to a chemical reaction site, which in this case is the spontaneous conversion of natural gas or methane into uh, synthesis gas. So really what, it, <coughs> what our technology, what this type of technology is, um, is developing is the, is the integration <coughs> of uh, oxygen separation with chemical processing. <coughs> and again, although I'm using synthesis gas as an example, there is a, we have uh, used this for a number of different, uh, different applications beyond, uh, <coughs> beyond uh, uh, synthesis gas. <coughs> These are the, the conventional um, processes which most of you, I'm sure, are quite familiar with for <coughs> uh, converting um, uh, natural gas to uh, synthesis gas. The <coughs> bottom line I really want to explain or, or point I want to get across here is that the <coughs> if you use um, uh, if you use steam reforming, <coughs> uh, of course that is an exothermic process. You need to introduce a significant amount of energy. If you look at the <coughs> processes where you convert um, natural gas into liquid fuels, uh, a very large part of the uh, costs associated with that process are the initial process of converting um, natural gas or methane into synthesis gas. It's a very energy intensive uh, uh, process. <coughs> the other issue which of course is exothermic is, the, um, is to use um, oxygen which will have been obtained from cryogenic sources <coughs> to promote this process and of course <coughs> although that this process is exothermic <clears throat> you have the uh, costs um, associated with the uh, 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 cryogenic separation and um, transportation of oxygen to the uh, <clears throat> chemical process site. <clears throat> so again, the uh, essential uh, feature <clears throat> of uh, catalytic, these types of catalytic membrane reactors is that uh, the oxygen separation in fact occurs in situ at site, on the site, so you directly separate out oxygen uh, on the um, reducing side of the membrane and again mediate it directly to the uh, chemical process site on the other side of the uh, other side of the membrane. <coughs> again this just <coughs> this is a sort of a propaganda type slide to show that uh, we <coughs> to show the various steps that are, are currently used for um, uh, separating out oxygen for chemical processing <coughs> and uh, uh, the technology that uh, we are developing is really hopefully it's going to be circumventing quite a lot of the, uh, the costs and complications and liabilities <coughs> associated with, um, uh, with the uh, conventional cryogenic uh, separation of uh, oxygen from the uh, from the atmosphere. <coughs> the, as I said, the <coughs> essential processes <coughs> occurring are um, <coughs> electrochemical in nature. We do not have <coughs> wires or um, electrodes in the in the conventional sense. But what 
we have. <clears throat> the typical configuration that we use for our membrane reactors are uh, closed one end tubes. Uh, we have closed one end tubes because it minimizes the, um, uh, the amount of seal area we, we have to utilize for the reactors. <clears throat> but on the air side, the essential process is that <clears throat> oxygen, uh, oxygen, molecular oxygen is separated from the atmosphere via a half reaction, which is electrochemical, and oxygen is in fact meat, becomes electrochemically reduced to oxygen anions. <clears throat> the oxygen anions might mediate in this direction from the uh, reducing side to the chemical <clears throat> oxidizing side of the membrane. <clears throat> at the same time, in the case of methane, and there are many chemistries you can look at on the uh, oxidizing side of the membrane, depending upon the catalysis that you, uh, <clears throat> you utilize here. <clears throat> on the oxidizing side of the membrane, um, there is this uh, partial oxidation process uh, can proceed to form synthesis gas. We, um, as I'll show, I'll show you some of the performance figures, some of the rates, um, some of the uh, CO to uh, hydro ratios that we have been uh, <clears throat> obtaining. But these these processes again, these these are half reactions, and um, uh, again, this is spontaneous thermodynamically downhill. Uh, 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 chemistry that is, uh, that is uh, uh, proceeding in these, uh, these reactors. <clears throat> this shows some of the, um, <clears throat> some of the um, applications that we have found and we are currently pursuing within our, <clears throat> within our company <clears throat> and the type of, uh, the type of chemistries that uh, one can, any kind of oxidative, partial oxidative type chemistry that you um, want to uh, develop really is very critically controlled by the nature of the, um, the catalysis that you um, deposit on either the um, uh, oxygen reduction surface that influences the, the rate at which you can get um, oxygen anions into the solid state lattice and the nature of the catalyst that you have on the, um, on the partial oxidation surface also influences the nature of the um, partial oxidation reaction product. I won't go into a lot of detail there except to <clears throat> say that um, uh, we, were, we have been quite surprised by the level of um, selectivity we can obtain with these kinds of processes. Um, the catalyst on the partial oxidation surface of these devices <clears throat> is typically a, a, a catalytic site which has, like the membrane, both oxygen anion and electron conductivity <clears throat> so that you can mediate oxygen as oxygen anions directly to the catalyst site. In a conventional um, heterogeneous um, uh, in, in conventional heterogeneous catalysis you have to which is involving oxygen you have to mediate both uh, a hydrocarbon and oxygen to the uh, to the catalyst site. In this particular case the, um, the mass transport limitation, if there is a mass transport limitation, is just by one species. And so your oxygen goes directly to the catalyst site where, uh, through the solid state uh, membrane. So the catalysis strategies we <clears throat> are developing for, these, uh, for this technology is it, really uh, very much emphasizing the development of catalysis, which has both ionic and electronic uh, conductivity. So these are some of the other applications. We can convert natural gas to ethylene. <clears throat> we um, uh, 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 reform uh, liquid fuels such as diesel fuel, uh, jet fuel, uh, to uh, synthesis gas. We're doing that for DARPA. <clears throat> we also, uh, uh, real extreme here, we've also put coal into these devices on the partial oxidation surface. Uh, <clears throat> not quite sure about the reaction mechanism in that case, obviously, uh, <clears throat> but we certainly have verified experimentally in a very empirical manner that we can gasify coal in the partial oxidation surface. <clears throat> we can use it for just straight oxygen separation, <clears throat> of course. Um, <clears throat> you don't quite have the same uh, thermodynamic driving force for chemistry to occur when you are operating with just a concentration gradient, but you certainly can uh, quite effectively uh, uh, separate out oxygen from the atmosphere. And there are all these other applications, the environmental applications, uh, uh, things like NOx decomposition, uh, toxic waste uh, combustion, you can promote uh, uh, 
uh, at relatively low rates at the present time, some kinds of combustion processes in the absence of nitrogen, which ha ha can, uh, have some, uh, can have some advantages. <coughs> uh, the um, types of materials that we have been looking at, uh, uh, that there are other people who are looking in this technology area. The, <coughs> when we first became interested in this area, uh, in the uh, sort of middle to late 80s, <coughs> and, uh, uh, and I realized that um, many folks who had considered this issue, and I think some of the initial thinking in this area did in fact start in Japan, <coughs> uh, and uh, that has been worked by others in the US, I recognize uh, uh, people at uh, Amoco, uh, BP, um, Harvard National Laboratories, <coughs> have been looking at this particular area. <coughs> the focus of the, the work by um, other folks in this area has been on so-called perovskite <coughs> materials which have the empirical composition, <coughs> ABO3, <coughs> the um, um, focus of our work has uh, been to uh, look at materials which, um, <coughs> which have an intrinsically high population of vacancy sites within the solid state lattice. <coughs> um, in a perovskite, uh, conventional perovskite, um, in order to introduce vacancy sites, that is, sort of lattice sites that don't have any stuff in them, <coughs> you have to depart, you have to introduce what is called an allovalent dopant into the solid state lattice. And the, <coughs> the issue with um, introducing dopants into the solid state lattice is that it, uh, <coughs> those dopants themselves can act as trap sites for <coughs> mediating uh, for the mediating oxygen anions throughout them. <coughs> so if you can look at a structure which has an intrinsically um, high population of vacancies, or it, then you can circumvent this whole issue of, um, uh, or one would hope in principle, to uh, uh, at least reduce the incidence of these, uh, these issues to do with um, the long-term maintenance of oxygen uh, diffusivity throughout the solid state lattice. <clears throat> the other issue, and the, these kind of brown Millerite uh, base materials have the empirical formula ABO2.5, which is what <coughs> this is supposed to uh, represent. <coughs> uh, but, um, but the materials themselves also, because they have less oxygen in them, are less vulnerable to <coughs> being chemically reduced <coughs> on the uh, hydrocarbon side of the, uh, the membrane. And so. In simple terms, this is really the genesis of both our um, solid electrolyte work and is still the basis of our solid electrolyte work, which is probably of a more academic nature at the present time, um, uh, but um, uh, because it's funded by NSF. Uh, but, um, uh, but certainly that's the genesis of, of our original rationale for selecting um, op what are really defined as, um, if you like, oxygen deficient um, uh, perovskites or uh, uh, brown mullerite based uh, solid state lattice. <coughs> so, <coughs> the, um, I'm not going to give you a lot of science here, but, <coughs> but basically, if you want to have a solid state lattice where you <coughs> can uh, have a rapid, uh, the ability to rapidly diffuse oxygen ions through that lattice, <coughs> whether it's the membrane part of the device or whether it's the catalyst part of the device, which is also in many of our applications are also mixed um, ionic and electronic uh, <coughs> conducting materials. There are two things you need to do. One is you need to have a lattice <coughs> where you have a relatively um, low <coughs> activation energy for um, the ionic uh, uh, diffusion uh, process. <coughs> and uh, secondly, you need to have uh, gain a solid state lattice where you have a high population of vacancy sites. And both of those requirements in part, have been uh, have been realized by the um, uh, by the uh, um, uh, brown mullerite based materials that we have um, that we have developed. And this basically says what I just said: two things: small activation energy and a high population of um, <coughs> of sites. The um, the uh, these are some of the issues that we. I've looked at over the years. I won't go into this in any great detail, but these are some of the parameters that we have very 
systematically looked at, uh, <clears throat> one finds that if you have uh, if you have a relatively weak metal oxygen bond within the the membrane or the um, or a catalyst on the partial oxidation surface, you you have conditions of very rapid mobility. <clears throat> but of course, if you have weak metal oxygen bonds, uh, you also have the uh, a, a, a strong opportunity for uh, the material actually being chemically reduced, and so there are <coughs> there are stability issues there. <clears throat> and so, with the membranes that we have developed, we have this compromise between rapid oxygen mobility <clears throat> and materials which are uh, thermodynamically stable. <clears throat> the degree of openness of the lattice, which we've defined as free volume, is really the, the volume occupied by the ionic constituents within a given crystal lattice. And, <clears throat> and quite obviously, if you have, uh, if you have a more degree of, uh, of openness within this lattice, you have uh, um, uh, generally opportunities for um, uh, lower activation energies, more mobility on the part of the uh, Diffusing species, and there's all these other issues here, which I won't, uh, <coughs> I won't get into. This last uh, bullet here, of course, is the bottom line issue that, uh, <coughs> although we can, uh, <coughs> uh, although folks can show performance with these membranes, which look very attractive for time periods, which can be a week or up to a month, <coughs> the important thing is that we, in fact, identify materials which have very good uh, longevity <coughs> under. Um, under hydrocarbon processing conditions, whatever they would, uh, <coughs> whatever they would be. <coughs> we also do some stuff which, uh, um, since we're in the um, <coughs> artificial intelligence neural network uh, computer type age, <coughs> and I have some people looking at this, um, <coughs> where we put in various uh, uh, thermodynamic and crystallographic parameters, and we. Um, try to correlate that with our experimental findings. And it, it sort of helps a bit. I mean, it kind of shows us trends a little bit. Uh, but the important thing is that um, uh, the vast majority of information that we obtain as a company is obtained, uh, uh, is obtained experimentally. Um, uh, where, although we do quite academic stuff, we do very much follow the the initial principles of Tom Edison, where we put things together initially, intuitively, <coughs> see how they work, and uh, and that's a pretty good uh, a pretty good point of departure. We find that we can either get 50 to 60 percent of where we want to get just by our intuitive selection of the <coughs> initial experiments. And this stuff is this stuff's okay, but uh, <coughs> but we get much further with experimental stuff, putting things together and and uh, <coughs> and, and making judgments based on hard experimental data than, uh, than uh, computer stuff, but um, <coughs> sometimes with some funding agencies, we, this, uh, this stuff does sell, so we, <coughs> so we, do, uh, we do try to do that. <coughs> um, <coughs> this just shows essentially the, um, <coughs> uh, the slide I showed you before, except I have carbon dioxide in, in this case, and as I indicated, um, <coughs> we have operated devices um, both with uh, methane and humidified methane and methane with carbon dioxide. And as I mentioned that um, uh, the, um, the separation of oxygen from the atmosphere and its subsequent in situ uh, chemical reaction with a hydrocarbon is a, is a thermodynamically downhill process, which means that it generates heat. <clears throat> and so in a large scale industrial type uh, process, um, uh, uh, one would have to have some uh, thermal <coughs> management strategy within the uh, <coughs> within the reactor. And this primarily shows the the fact that we can introduce and we do introduce carbon dioxide <coughs> into some of our reactors, so that the carbon dioxide methane reforming reaction, <coughs> which is uh, an endothermic uh, process, can be used to uh, manage the um, chemistry. Uh, all the th uh, can act as a strategy for thermal management on the uh, the uh, partial oxidation surface. The um, uh, and that same argument applies to to steam as well. Uh, uh, steam methane reforming, as I mentioned earlier, is an endothermic process. Uh, our empirical process is exothermic, so we have 
<coughs> to uh, compensate for that exothermicity by introducing some other stuff in there, which is either um, carbon dioxide or steam, uh, to uh, <coughs> manage the uh, <coughs> manage the chemistry which is occurring within the uh, within the device. <coughs> it just shows some of the performance that we have obtained. We, in fact, this slide goes out to over a year. <coughs> um, the uh, <coughs> the little bumps up and down are, uh, are really not uh, uh, um, not experiment. They're, they're a reflection of the fact that we don't have a GC plumbed into our uh, into our reactors. And so, when people take samples, these little peaks go up and down. But we're just basically showing the uh, the raw data. <coughs> this is some of the performance we were obtaining about uh, <coughs> about three years ago. Uh, and uh, in fact, this. Uh, these kind of reactors operated continuously for <clears throat> over a year, it was sort of a year and a few days, uh, uh, in fact. And we had a, a number of people come into witnesses taking these devices down. <clears throat> uh, this just shows the, um, uh, the CO uh, hydrogen ratio. Uh, we, with these devices, we are getting typically, um, uh, typically uh, two hydrogen molecules to every CO, which I guess is <clears throat> what, uh, what is required for um, uh, certainly converting methane to, uh, to methanol. <coughs> um, I have a, um, <coughs> this is something plagiarized in part from, uh, from the Westinghouse solid oxide fuel cell program, but this is one concept where one could uh, uh, readily scale up um, a, um, a catalytic membrane reactor for the uh, for separating oxygen in situ. I guess I guess I'm, I hear that uh, oxygen um, <coughs> oxygen costs forty to forty five dollars a ton. I just hear that second hand, and I guess that's fairly close to what the <coughs> what the, uh, the current cost is. So there's a considerable cost savings there. <coughs> these are the current. These are <coughs> these are the, the um, um, catalytic membrane reactor performance characteristics that we were obtaining about. Uh, a couple of years ago, two, three years ago, the reason I keep talking in that time frame is the fact that <coughs> this tech, that the, our, our technology for Syngas <coughs> has been uh, picked up, uh, uh, was, is the basis of a uh, large consortium which is in fact headed uh, by my colleagues at Air Products at, in Allentown, Pennsylvania. <coughs> um, it's a very large program, it's about $84 million, eight years, uh, uh, based upon this membrane technology where we have a number of uh, 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 very heavy hitters in the uh, in the development of this technology. So, the results and information I'm giving you is, is two three years old, and I obviously can't talk about the stuff that uh, we're doing as of this moment. But as of two years ago, this was the type of uh, performance we <coughs> were getting for uh, syngas production. Uh, <coughs> these were membranes that were operating at 900 degrees centigrade, something I haven't mentioned before. <coughs> um, they, um, uh, uh, the membranes themselves are about one millimeter thick <coughs> and they were able to uh, mediate oxygen across the membranes at the range of around um, 10 to 12 mils per minute per square centimeter. <coughs> um, the, again, the hydrogen to CO ratio was in around, uh, 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 around two. <coughs> the throughput conversions we're getting um, uh, and we're getting after this data are, are essentially are, are essentially close to very close to 100%. <coughs> uh, it really depends on your process operating conditions. Where and we're utilizing about 70% of the oxygen from the uh, from the atmosphere per pass in the reactor. <coughs> and most significantly, we have in fact operated the um, the these devices uh, continuously for um, for one year, <coughs> which uh, uh, which we were very, uh, very impressed with uh, ourselves, <coughs> quite surprised. Um, <coughs> this just shows some of the very early evidence that we had stability. We had some devices that had, in fact, <coughs> operated uh, uh, for an excess of a thousand hours, and for some reason we relocated our uh, facilities within Boulder, and, uh, <coughs> and we took these samples down, and we found that the X-ray diffraction patterns were essentially identical, and these were device that had operated in excess of a thousand hours uh, with uh, a considerable oxygen partial pressure gradient across the devices and they, they, uh, they, that's kind of a yardstick for stability with these materials if you can operate a device with uh, something like a 10 to the minus 17 oxygen partial pressure that's certainly indicative of, um, of 
considerable, um, <coughs> considerable stability. Um, and this is really the last, or the penultimate slide. Uh, <coughs> and this is kind of a bottom line issue that we <coughs> did in fact take our samples that, um, and the membranes that we had operated for an excess of one year, we did exhaustive um, <coughs> uh, testing, not in our laboratory, but uh, uh, from a, a private company we employed to examine our materials, and we found no evidence of any, um, <coughs> any uh, um, chemical instability on the part of the membrane. Uh, in fact, when we looked at our <coughs> initial X-ray diffraction patterns from uh, the uh, uh, membrane compositions we looked at, we saw some evidence uh, <coughs> when we first made them that there was a <coughs> possibly uh, a, um, uh, a second, uh, second phase, that just a suggestion of a second phase, but after one year of continuous operation, and admittedly <coughs> at uh, 900 degrees centigrade, the material was uh, was single phase after uh, after one year. That second phase had kind of disappeared and it probably merely represented the fact that when we made the tubes and we sintered them and, and then went through our ceramic processing within our company, we uh, we didn't completely sinter the material into uh, into totally. We're talking about one or two percent here. We're not talking about a major <coughs> a major issue. So we <coughs> so that's really all I want to say. I, I guess as far as catalytic uh, <coughs> membrane reactors are concerned, we see there's a ton of different applications for them. Any kind of chemical process that, uh, <coughs> that where, you, um, uh, where you need to use, um, where you need to separate out oxygen from the atmosphere, um, <coughs> these kind of membrane reactor technologies can uh, <coughs> really offer, we think, and of course we're prejudiced, we <coughs> sometimes we're unwittingly in a marketing situation, but <coughs> um, but they really do give a, a, an opportunity for different types of catalysis to be implemented, and in particular, the <coughs> in particular the um, the development of catalysts which have the ability to both have electronic <coughs> and ionic uh, conductivity. <coughs> and the findings that we have developed in our company have <coughs> have had, in fact, spin-offs uh, in our the development of our technology in, in fact heterogeneous catalysis, and we're doing a lot of work currently for the um, <coughs> for the Air Force and for EPRI, the Electric Power Research Institute, <coughs> in the area of uh, decomposing NOx under net oxidizing conditions. And the <coughs> the genesis of that work was the recognition that um, uh, that NOx decomposition, uh, uh, the conventional um, NOx catalysts that we have um, available to us today become very readily poisoned by oxygen. That is really a consequence of oxygen absorption on the surface. So if you can have catalysts <coughs> which have an intrinsically rapid uh, oxygen mobility, such as in a catalyst particle which also has uh, oxygen um, uh, ion uh, uh, mobility or conductivity, <coughs> there is the uh, opportunity, and we are certainly verifying this in the laboratory today in, in desorbing those species and maintaining, uh, uh, maintaining uh, longevity. So, um, so uh, there are implications in this kind of work both for uh, new catalysis that are directly implemented on the, on the catalytic membrane reactors and also the, the, uh, also the, the application of these catalysts in, in more conventional type uh, configurations and heterogeneous uh, 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 type of devices. So, thanks for your attention. Please uh, answer any question you may Thank you for a very interesting uh, look at a new way to get to the chemistry that you want. This, uh, these membranes really offer, in a lot of areas, special uh, selectivities and special economics and special purity. So, any questions? No, Dr. Samuels. Yeah. This one, when you think about membrane, you think of osmotic pressure. Is there any way that you can increase the pressure of oxygen, say, on one side, and increase the diffusion of the oxide through the lattice, or apply a potential across your ceramic? Yeah. Um, of course, you, what you're dealing with here is thermodynamics. If you increase the um, if you increase the pressure, for example, on the oxygen side, you will increase the activity of oxygen. Uh, to mediate across. Um, um, uh, 
if you look at electrically driven oxygen separation, that's quite expensive. And, and uh, of course we can do that very readily, but the, uh, we feel, and we're told by a number of people, that the attractiveness of this kind of technology is the fact that you um, that it is spontaneous. You don't need to have a lot of fancy wires and stuff like that. <clears throat> in the case of, uh, and the pressure thing is, is probably more important than the issue of like atmospheric oxygen separation where you have a put in the pressure and you have then, you create, an, uh, you create a, uh, a, a, a concentration or a nerve or a thermodynamic driving force, but in the case of um, um, a, a, a hydrocarbon partial oxidation process, you have a lot of driving force there. And so, you, and, and that's the really advantage, you don't need wires and all the complications and, and, and costs and things that can go around because the electronic connectivity is an, is an intrinsic part of the, of the membrane itself. Uh, preparing my, my review, I find, found in the literature the, uh, the study of Aragon National Laboratories uh, made, uh, concerning the same reaction yes. and using uh, ceramic foam and rhodium <coughs> deposited on ceramic foam. You know probably more about this and could you, could you say something or comment this in comparison with your, <coughs> with your study? <coughs> Um, we do have um, the, the catalysis that we have been emphasizing, uh, as I mentioned, are, are catalysts which have mixed, uh, mixed conductivity on the partial oxidation surface. The, um, um, uh, you're correct that, uh, as I mentioned, there was a, um, a, a, a business relationship between Argonne National Laboratory and Amoco and BP and those guys. Uh, the difference between their material and our material is the fact that we, our membrane materials, have um, a significant oxygen def deficiency. <clears throat> and that oxygen deficiency does two things. Uh, first of all, it gives us increased chemical stability, and secondly, gives us the opportunity to have, um, to, uh, um, have a, a high population of vacancy sites within that uh, solid state lattice for the oxygen anions to diffuse across. <coughs> um, um, uh, I, I, our process is also all totally integrated into one step. Um, uh, I've heard, uh, I've heard some, I heard um, that sometimes the um, the Amoco um, Argon BP system may not be, um, but they are making progress and they are a direct competitor. So I'm not going to stand here and castigate them because they're a good bunch of guys. But um, but the fundamental difference is the fact that. Um, uh, that our material is uh, it is a sort of a brown right derived. It uh, it has we believe we have uh, a, a, a quite <coughs> outstanding stability in the performance of our material has been verified by other people, not just us sort of doing these experiments and making our own spin on it. And in fact, uh, uh, so I think that's the major difference. There. But the catalysis uh, the catalysis strategy is is somewhat different. <coughs> we can. Um, if you have a catalyst site on the partial oxidation surface, and if all of that catalyst has the opportunity to mediate oxygen ions to that partial oxidation surface, <clears throat> then you can have the opportunity for uh, more significant rates. If the catalyst is primarily ceramic in nature, <clears throat> you are uh, potentially circumventing some of the long-term materials issues that one can find with other kinds of uh, uh, strategies. So, Thank you. Another question here. Did you say something about the, uh, the thickness of your uh, ceramic? <coughs> yeah, yeah. I, I didn't mention that earlier, but you know, I said a lot of things. Uh, uh, um, the the, mem the membranes are typically um, we make um, our kind of workhorse device is a closed one end ceramic tube, and the wall thickness is typically around one millimeter. Varies between 0 0.9 to 1.1. Another question here. If I understand it correctly, essentially you have the membrane and you coat onto it or somehow on, each side. on either side. Can you say anything about what that catalytic material is on the two sides in the case, for example, of the methane uh, selective or oxygen form of it? A couple of years ago I could, uh, uh, less, less today because uh, I have a lot more, uh, something I'm not used to being a small business guy, but uh, I have a lot more restrictions on what I can say, but I, I, I think on the oxygen side, we are typically looking at um, 
ground millerite based materials which have transition metals in them, uh, which uh, are designed to have rapid oxygen reduction kinetics. Uh, on the um, uh, on the partial oxidation surface, it may be less critical what you use, as long as it's a good mixed ionic and electronically conducting um, uh, uh, material. Um, I didn't answer your question today. Maybe, maybe I'll ask it again. <laughs> could, you, could you like coat on a little metal thing type surface? Not, not, not a membrane, but just in fact do a small impregnation. Uh, sometimes we have uh, impregnated a, a non-noble metal. We do not use noble metals on that. that, that, that. All of these, the, uh, uh, that's another thing I, I, I'd like to mention is that the, um, uh, the, um, the, the, the substituents of the membrane are, are, are really very inexpensive. Uh, there's nothing fancy in there, no uh, uh, in fancy, rare, sort of part-defying type metals that are found in remote parts of the world. They, they're pretty inexpensive. Uh, we don't have any uh, precious metal catalysts. Uh, uh, electrochemists are always prone to using dispersed platinum for different, uh, promoting different chemistries, and we do not use that at all. That, that, it's all cheap stuff. Okay, one more question. <coughs> uh, what is the uh, low temperature limit of uh, meaningful uh, device? Yeah, good point, yeah. Um, uh, we are told that 900 degrees is a good temperature for reforming. And we say that uh, it's also convenient because at 900 degrees, we uh, since the uh, ionic diffusivity through the membranes is a you know a, a, an R radius type uh, process, uh, the higher the temperature within material stability, the better. <coughs> um, it's quite feasible you can get down to say 750 degrees centigrade, and one can invoke arguments of making thinner structures, uh, and, and we and a lot of other people are looking with different levels of success on supported dense membranes on porous substrates. Um, and we are currently looking at that with, with mixed results, I might add. Uh, but that's a very tough issue. Uh, but there are people who are a lot more skilled in ceramic processing than us who I think are having some real success there. And if you can have a, a thinner structure, um, uh, you can uh, you can maintain that kind of oxygen flux at a lower temperature, <clears throat> but as far as chemical processing, I'm told that 900 degrees is the is the sort of temperature we should be at. Um. Okay, thank you very much. Right, we're going to move Dr. Uh, X Zahn's uh, presentation until after lunch because it's already quarter after twelve. And uh, what I, what I really at uh, this morning session. I thought it was really exciting, very interesting. Professor Gorday on the cerium oxygen zirconium chemistry, Dr. Newsom, combinatory testing techniques and potential for screening, uh, rapid screening of heterogeneous catalysis, Dr. Cockhuffle, present and future trends in catalysis, Dr. Davis and gas to liquids, Fisher Tropes overview, a tremendous overview of the power plant operations and potential commercial uh, applications, and then of course this presentation by Dr. Tony Samuels. I mean, it's been an outstanding morning and we're looking forward to another day and a half to two days of this. Uh, lunch is served, where about? In the Keeneland room. In the Keeneland room. Which is just directly straight across. And your chairman for this afternoon is? Is uh, Steve Austin. Steve is going to be our chairman this afternoon. So thank you all very much.